their comments and their attendance at that same time. Um, as was stated in the email message that you received uh, at the presentation, um, you'll remember one of the comments we got from probably more than one person or, uh, was that it would be helpful to show some examples of street cross sections in our current developments and compare those to the equivalent sections in the manual to see if, if there's any significant difference between the two. And we will be prepared to do that at, uh, at the presentation. Um, and uh, if you have any questions or comments that you want to submit to us before that meeting, submit them to Ashley, and I think that's what the email required uh, are asking you to do. Uh, with that, I'll ask Ashley if she wants to um, point anything out for them to look at, in particular in the second draft, uh, changes that were made uh, between the first draft and the second draft. Definitely the cross section, but I think that you covered everything else. Um, please send any comments that you might have. It is a 92-page document for those of you who haven't looked at it yet. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, I've got some questions. And, and, and actually, since I won't be here on the 20th, I will probably get together with Gary with, you know, beforehand or right after. And we also explain in the cover message that uh, we pulled out this, the part of that manual that applies to the Flexco district because that's gotten kind of complicated, has been complicated. Um, rather than uh, ask for the adoption of that manual with an incomplete section that may affect others, uh, we've pulled it out from now, and we can always add it in this amendment um, if we're not prepared to do that when the balance of the manual is ready for adoption. Yeah, and correct me if I, if I didn't read it correctly. It seems that the guidelines are going to be more applicable to the areas that use flux code. No, no, no. ma'am. So it will okay. apply to all new streets okay. in the town of Leland, regardless of zoning district. Okay. Um, in the cross section, section 5.1 of the manual applies to the flux code, and 5.2 will be cross sections for our conventional zoning districts. So 5.2, okay. the cross sections in five, section 5.2 um, should be a big focus of what we're getting ready to discuss. I think that's, yes, ma'am. Anybody Any else questions? have a call? Okay. Uh, next, we have an update on the Cape Fear Crossing corridor selection. Um, we're pretty much where we were. Uh, I think we discussed this the last time we got together, I'm not sure, but they are down to uh, just a few uh, choices now. And uh, fortunately, they did leave in uh, the preferred route of both the WNPO and those of us here in Leland because it avoids uh, most of our newly uh, populated areas. Um, and that's the uh, MA and NA corridors. And I'll pass this around so you can see. But there's still some problems with a couple of the other corridors that could impact some of our uh, larger neighborhoods. So um, we're just going to have to see how, they, how it all shakes out. Let's see.
there is going to be a discussion, I think, at the next meeting of the WMPO Transportation Board about tolls on the Cape Fear crossing. It will be a toll road. <laughs> and no one will take it. And it'll be just sit there. <laughs> yeah, just sit there. That's what everybody says. I'm going to pay you guys. This is starting to feel like living in the big city. Truckers won't pay, <laughs> truckers won't pay the <laughs> price. <city. laughs> truckers won't pay the price. People won't pay the price. They'll go the old way and they go unpaid. Tim, I think they're, they're um, I'm sorry. Um, I think their, their thing is that the truckers won't be allowed the other roads, oh. so they'll have to. See, that's smart. If it's legal. Maybe. They have they haven't said that out loud, but <laughs> but they want to get they want to get the trucks off their Wilmington streets. So how much does the sign cost to hold all of these people's names to hang on the bridge <laughs> in their honor? I love this. But okay. it'll be an electron, electronic billboard. Oh, <laughs> Do it handle change as far as Lewis. My brothers hang a people on the bridge. Since we're, we're talking about the uh, Cape Fear Memorial Bridge, uh, I will have more information soon as to <laughs> the closures of the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge that are anticipated this spring as they replace the steel decking. Oh, who's it? Makes a steel decking. Oh, oh. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> this will be a, a good test of the Mallory Creek connector when the <laughs> 133 gets backed up. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? <laughs> Just keep fighting. Just may hang in there. Y'all, I will tell you, Pat fights hard on that MTO gets... I know um, she does. I've seen her in action. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. It might be helpful if at some point we put this so that we can put it on the screen. <coughs> then we could have shown it to you, I guess. We'll do that for the next meeting. See it. 
Okay. I'll go check it out. So eventually, the expectation would be that road would get extended into Brunswick Forest and become another point of ingress and egress. So again, so rather than uh, following DOT procedures, which could be more costly than our own, um, we wanted a better way to manage that road. So now we're going to take those steps to dedicate it to us as a town road. Any questions? Yes, sir. Does it at any point right now cross the railroad? No. It just parallels? Yes. And dead end? If you went a little bit farther, you'd, you'd be at Stony Creek and you'd sneak on. You know that. Cape Todd Road? Yeah. It's, it's in that line. I'll have to look at the map again. I didn't know that. Sure. Yeah, it's, isn't it when you, when you pass Cape, if you're going south and you pass Cape Todd, just a little bit down the road on the left, you're going to have yeah. Stony Creek and Stay Farm. Mm -hmm. yeah. You probably can't notice it because you get that barrier up. I'll have to look. It's an interesting path. It kind of snakes back. its way. Yes. It's not a direct it's parallel to the railroad track. It snakes oh, I thought its way it was. Around. Not directly. No, it, it snakes around after it comes off of 17 and then ends up parallel. Uh, any other comments, questions? We go on to the next one, the diverging diamond landscape. So I'm not sure we've talked about this project at this committee meeting, at these committee meetings in the past, but as part of the diverging diamond project that was completed last year, um, there was a landscape budget allotted to landscape that interchange in some way. And that's in the neighborhood of $300,000, roughly. So the Department of Transportation has met with the town of Belleville and the town of Leland to give us an opportunity to weigh in on what we'd like to see put into that interchange as far as landscaping. So we will help design the landscape within that budget. Um, we actually met with them for the first time many months ago and no, no action has been taken since then, so we'll wait to get some feedback. Their, their design architect, or landscape design architect, was supposedly <coughs> putting together a concept plan uh, that gives us an idea of what can be done within that $300,000 budget. Who's the person you're talking about? Pardon me? Who's the designer are you talking about? Department of Transportation's oh. designer. Yeah, they will design it. It'll be because it's part of their project. Is there water available in that? Uh, there's a source of water. Um, I've been told, I think, near our sign there, um, but there's not been any, to my knowledge, I don't think there's an irrigation system roughed in around the interchange. I don't think they had the foresight to roughing in conduit under the pavement, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we'll probably be pretty limited. I mean, uh, going to have to find some pretty hardy plants that can grow in that kind of environment. They should uh, probably consider xeriscaping. Yeah. Well, I know at our first meeting we, we talked about a number of things, including no plants. <laughs> but um, we'll see where that goes. I'll keep you all updated as time goes on. If you're driving south out of the town of Lutheran to the Diverging Diamond, just basically where does the area begin and end that's included in the landscaping budget? So, um, I guess roughly where the maybe the traffic signal is as you if you're coming if you're going toward Wilmington. Okay. And if you, if you were to turn right to go to Belleville, mm -hmm. there's a sign that says "Welcome to Belleville." That would be about the limit on that side. Okay. And then going toward Wilmington, there's a traffic light uh, after you come and if you go under the bridge. Okay. There's a traffic light there that's roughly pushes the on ramp going in the opposite direction. That would roughly be the okay. uh, limit on the other side. Thanks. So it's on the um, 
the drip. Yeah, the, the Leland side of the ramps, the drip farthest ramps, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm.
we'll be talking about Plouffe Road later, but um, there's going to be changes being made to the traffic signals at that intersection due to the road construction, and the developer is paying for those changes to those traffic signals. So that is normal. Any other questions? I'll keep you all informed as we learn more about that traffic signal. Yeah, uh, how is this going to help the fire station? Isn't there supposed to be a flashing light when there's a fire on the floor? I, I can't answer that. I know there was a discussion at some point of, in fact, I think you were part of that conversation. You suggested, well, if they can't get the traffic light now, can we at least get a, yeah. a, a flashing, light. flashing light at the fire station? But I think that was in the context as a substitute rather than a traffic signal. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll ask the question when we, uh, when we meet. But at this point, there's nothing in the driveway for a minute to speak to. Uh, that's a whole different issue. I think that's something the town would probably be required to install. So that's, it's just now a now fire department. I'm sure it's far less costly to install one of those signals than
won't at the outset. We'll be able to get started on the project. Okay. Uh, without it. Would it help our commuters to direct them in the opposite direction to pick up the I-140 instead of trying to get through Village Road? To well, I think we'll let them shoot, decide that. I don't think, you know, if we start suggesting things, that could end up into a, a daily dialogue. Um, so it what will, I'm going to do... It will anyway. So we can post, <laughs> we're, we're posting this letter on our website. You know, we're going to post on social media so people are aware of what's going on. Uh, hopefully they'll find the best way, the most convenient way for them to travel as time goes on. I know we're going to get phone calls. Um, and like I say, in the letter we've given them, uh, Mr. Vetter's phone number. <laughs> Not mine. So uh, that's the two shopping centers and all the businesses that are. Yeah, the fast med. Actually, the turn lane on the north side of the village road starts on the fast med property that far back. Okay. Uh, so in many cases, these businesses don't own their property. So we're notifying both the property owners and the businesses in the case that the property owners don't notify the businesses. And it's the businesses that are going to be the ones affected in those cases, not the property owners. Uh, the, the auto parts store, CBS, all those, um, the seafood, the propane store, obviously. Uh, Dr. Crumshaw's office, Dr. Um, Bodish's office, so they will all be notified. And most of those know that this was coming. Uh, I'm dreading it. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a much improved intersection and a much improved road. So maybe we need to do a new Leland, you don't know, tour and, and show them a roundabout ways to get to some of these places. <laughs> um, what I'll do is um, I'll ask Morris you to send all the council members a copy of that letter um, because you'll probably get phone okay. calls too. That way you'll yes, see what we Yes, let's post it on next door. <laughs> Because there is ways to get to those businesses without yeah. being on village right there. And in our letter, we tried to put it in a in as good of a reflection as we can as far as it's going to be an improvement. It's going to be a huge improvement yeah. when it's done. And that it's been planned for many, many years. No pain, no gain. Anybody got any questions? Anybody have an idea for a round the world tour during the course of the project? Yeah, I want to go on that tour. I want to go yeah, on that tour. <laughs> for what it's worth, you know, I've been the, the, the cynic skeptic about the Cape Fear and Holmes Bridge being either open, closed, out of commission during especially rush hour. I live right at the intersection of 140 and 17, and I work uh, approximately at the airport. And in the interest of self-preservation and Easter approaching and the summer driving season approaching, I got curious as to the time required for me to get from where I work to home on Friday evening, which is probably historically the worst time, especially in the summer, by either going across the Holmes Bridge and the Causeway or going out Castle Hayne Road to 140 and back around. The good news is that there is a difference of two minutes or less. Although 140 is appears to be much longer on a, on a map, the speed limit is 70 miles an hour and there's nobody out there. However, if you come across the bridge, you don't know how many other people are there, the bridge is up or down, and so on. So, for whatever it's worth, to get from my house to the airport, the difference going way out and around is less than two minutes. Wow. That's good. Everybody should try that. Yeah, yeah I will. There'll I likely agree. be much more traffic during the season. Yeah, the summer more, season. Yeah. But there are no traffic lights, and the bridge yeah. isn't up. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And you'll still be doing yeah, 70 miles an hour. Well, and the whole point of waiting to do this uh, 
bridge decking replacement uh, was to wait until the I-140 was available. Because originally they were talking about closing down the Cape I think they've stepped away from that at well, this point. But The reason I bring it up mainly is that I recall approximately Easter last year, it was a Friday afternoon, must have been Good Friday, and it was raining cats and dogs. It took me 45 minutes to make a 20 minute drive. If I can cut that to 23 minutes instead of 21 minutes by going out Castle A and across 140, boy, you know, I will not try that during the summer. Again, knowing that I can travel, hopefully travel 140 at 70 miles an hour, literally almost from door to door, versus going across either of the bridges. So for whatever it's worth to the, the residents who could commute by going out that way and back, you're not talking about a whole lot of time difference. In the, in the best of conditions. All righty. Uh, any other comments on Northgate? Go on to Plouffe Road construction. So this construction activity, uh, primarily centered around the Aldi um, store there, is well behind schedule, to no one's surprise, uh, due exclusively to weather conditions. So, temperature and now rain. Um, they've got the curb and gutter in for the, the new portion of the roads. Um, they've got some of the base in, I think. Um, and everything they're doing now is, is weather dependent. So as, as soon as they get a window of, of good, good weather, um, they'll be able to complete that and get the pavement down. <clears throat> There's still some work to be done out on 17. That'll be the final phase. Um, as well as putting in a, a median on Ploof as you come in from 17. Um, that'll be the final phase. But the, the big work at the new roundabout and the connection between what was formerly Ploof Road Extension and Ploof Road, um, or hopefully, uh, we're hopefully going to expect that to be completed later on in March. Uh, again, Gary, will the, will the name of Ploof Road change? So Ploof Road, as it comes from 17, is a DOT road. It will remain a DOT road. It will remain named Ploof Road. The roundabout and every the road that we're putting in, the new road, the new section of road beyond the roundabout, will be a town road. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be called, it's already named Tradeway Drive. Yeah, I saw the signs, and that's why yeah. I asked. So Blue Road would just go around the roundabout and go on into the around by the arbors and all. That's correct. And then the connecting road that's partially completed from Ocean Gate to Aldi right now will be completed to the roundabout, and there'll be a new name um, for that road. Um, there's not been a name uh, a name selected by the developer yet, and the intent would be at some point I'm sure that that developer will pass the path to dedicate that road. And again, I'll keep everyone updated. We, we post this uh, updated schedules on our website and various social media every couple of weeks as we hear from the contractor and get updates from him. Anybody any other comments on that? <clears throat> All right. Uh, the status of the mixed use development on Highway 133 South. I wanted to just bring this up because. Um, if you travel 133, this project is bothersome. Uh, it is going to be dangerous for people getting in and out of it. It's a mixed use development that is next to Old Town. So if you're traveling, let's say you're going north on 133, it's on the left, just right after Old Town. Coming from south, will be on the right before you get to Old Town. There is no turn lane. It's on a curve. <laughs> uh, 
they did not have to have a TIA because they only have nine units, but there are nine big units with many units in them. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. Um, if you, I think if you're driving that road, you got to be careful. Your residents need to know to be careful. Um, and I, I, I did talk to uh, Carol Collette at NCDOT, and as usual, there's nothing we can do about it. But <laughs> so that's that's the steps. Is that, is that right? It's, an e it's another Evolve project. They're the ones that built uh, Hawthorne and on Plouffe and 17. Um, they seem to be buying up a lot of land for mixed use development. So, so just wanted to. That'll be fun. Mm -hmm, just wanted to keep you up to date on that. And I mean, if it really gets. If it's painfully obvious. Something's going to have to be done. First, correct. I mean, yeah, the first person that got, gets killed. Yep, I mean, exactly. right. um, Then we uh, have this situation that's arisen for our poor folks that live in Windsor Park, and that is the noise coming from the I 140. Um, I think most may already know this, but I'll, I'll repeat it, that um, putting in a sound wall now, NCD, NCDOT does not have to do it, and they're not going to do it. Um, what happened was, if, as the law reads, if the project, the road project, is on the books first, prior to subdivision project being put on the books, they don't have any obligation to do anything. Um, we did speak with uh, uh, Karen Collette about this, and she did whatever she could to try to help, but uh, it just turns out that there's just not much she can do. She did recommend, however, that the uh, residents who live in Windsor Park consider uh, instead of a wall trying to plant uh, substantial trees and shrubbery to be your noise abatement um, and as you know as many people know trees do filter um, air pollution um, as well as act as a sound barrier and they're a lot more attractive than a concrete wall. So anyway, that was that was her recommendation, and um, I think that that's where we are with this right now. Uh, if we could get the developer to acknowledge that it is really to everyone's benefit if he facilitates getting something done, that would be terrific. I, I don't know how we're going to do that, but that would be that would be terrific. Uh, the town can't do anything because you're dealing with private property on one side, and you're dealing with property that belongs to the Federal Highway Administration and NCDOT on the other side. So we have no stuff that we can do. Um, so I wanted to bring that up tonight and see if we should discuss. What, if anything, can we do to prevent something like this from happening again? Is there something in our ordinances that can change, our zoning code that can change? Or? Well, we have landscape buffers <coughs> in our ordinance, but they don't apply to a condition like this. Yeah. But we can certainly look into it um, to require a developer to extend or maintain a buffer between the DOT right away and the private property. It seems like Compass Point, their developer, did do that. He didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, really? Oh my 
gosh. I take that back. Yeah. And yes. it's the same developer. <laughs> Are you no, having no, no, the no, no, I don't think it's the same. No. Basically, it is. Well, oh, maybe okay. <laughs> 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 I can't show for these. Yeah. I, first of all, um, we do have a couple trees in between the highway and a couple of trees. We appreciate um, you know, uh, that you're having this this discussion and even on behalf of Windsor Park. Uh, and I know it impacts you guys incredibly badly. But it is also impacting us uh, in, in a certain rather significant area of the entire development. Compass Point is very huge. Yeah. So, um, and while the developer did plan, um, it is nowhere near what's necessary to help with noise abatement of any sort. And on top of that, in a, the certain most heavily affected areas, we see the cars the same as you guys do. They're not as near to us as yours. Um, you know, for what it's worth, theirs is a huge safety issue. Um, huge safety issue. Maybe ours is a pretty large safety issue, too. You don't want a tanker going over on that highway. Yes, and, from, and my particular house, it's that right could be, highway. yes, that could be a, a real issue. Um, so, you know, yeah, I don't understand how the North Carolina DOT is not responsible to put up a sound wall. I came from New York, New Jersey, it's all the same. And if they build any highway, especially in interstate, anywhere near a development, there's a sound wall put up before they even put the hard, the asphalt down. They put that up without even a consideration for the people who bought it. You guys paid a lot of money for your house, so did I. Our properties are, are, are they're in the pits. That's my, this is my life savings. I worked 30 years for an airline company, but to come here and, and have somebody from North Carolina DOT tell me, oh, I'm sorry, we can't do nothing because the road's already built. Well, the road should have been taken care of before it was built. Well, unfortunately, Actually, the law is, is, it's a Federal Highway Administration law, so it filtered down to the state. If the uh, roadway project is <coughs> on the books to be done first, and then a developer comes along years later and says, oh, I'm going to buy this piece of property here, and I'm going to put a subdivision in there. And and he knows, he knows that there's going to be a road. <laughs> However, didn't you uh, previously cite, um, and, and I hope I'm not out of order here. Well, uh, we're, it's, it's, I, I don't mean to do we'll, that. We'll let you did talk. you not previously cite uh, the issue of traffic lights um, that when the developer got the permits to put the driveways in for the developments, he had to agree to put traffic lights up at some point when the traffic became and that's, worthy of it. That's what NCDOT, see Nancy DOT does a traffic impact analysis of a, of a new community and they tell them you're going to have to have a light or you don't have so to there's have a no light. Other, there's, so there's no other impact analysis done because I would have thought that when the developer went to put in Windsor Park and Compass Point that they would have said we're putting a highway in and at some point when that highway uh, is, is it you know causes noise pollution you the developer are going to have to um, figure out something to do with this yeah so we don't we don't have that but it, that didn't happen here and i would also respectfully say you know if I, I think somebody questioned the, the issue of the developer um, having to pay for those traffic lights I heard that correctly. Yeah. But I do believe that um, the developer is developing this area, is adding to the income of this area, and is also receiving an enormous amount of income. So I do believe that there are um, regulations that they should be held to um, in terms of the product that they sell to people. And 
we are the people that they sold this product to. This is, yeah, and this is why uh, I was just asking uh, Mr. Bidmar, you know, what is, is there something we can do to strengthen our building codes? Well, even so, even if we strengthen ours, that wouldn't help people like them. That's no, not in the towns. Yeah, that's true. Our developer gave the dirt to build I-140. We had a lake. <laughs> Would be, I got a 28-acre lake. I go to sleep at night and I hear trucks going through my bedroom. And I have a thousand dollars worth of soundproof Glass. on my windows. And it still comes through. It seems to me that you should have a certain amount of control, though, whether you have control of the highway department or not, clearly you don't. But when a developer comes to you to develop uh, a community within your um, area, don't you have the ability to tell them they have to offset the houses 100 yards, 300 yards, whatever it is, from the highway that may be built over the next 10 years? Yeah, well, see, in the case of the town of Leland, if you're in the town of Leland, this is what we're talking about right, now. Right, right. How do we prevent something like this from happening? Yes, I, I get that. It would have certainly helped them. It probably wouldn't have helped us anyways. Because we, we don't know the town, town we're in. Town. <laughs> you're in the county. You're in the county. Yeah. Wherever we may be, nobody's taking our developer and t telling him he needs to do this. When we, when we bought property there, we were told nothing about that this highway was going to be a noise problem. We were told they were thinking about putting a highway in or they were going to put a highway in. It's not going to be any problem. It's far away from the development. Okay, fine. So they buy property, spend a ton of money on a property. There's a train out in front of our development. Do you know that train runs 24-7? Anytime it feels like blowing its whistle at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping, and we were told the guys, train only runs once a month. Once a month, we were told. Uh, well, I one I'm train. We get it every morning. Pick, it, <laughs> pick an hour. He's good at this. Pick an hour. He doesn't care. He bends it eight times, which is a federal law. He has to. But all be that all the, the you know we we're left with this problem now, and it is a big problem. Now. Um, and again, I I take my hat off to the town of Leland for at least listening. Guys, and, and hopefully, well, it stinks really. No. We, we feel we feel for you. So, do you folks on the council have any suggestions for we who are residents facing this problem? I understand you all have limitations as a town, as a municipal governing body. We can only do what we can do. What can we do? We know we can buy to um, just to serve. <laughs> Okay, Terry. <coughs> I got involved in this whole thing in 2006 because we purchased a brand new home in 2004 in Snee Farm. There are approximately 150 homes there, and there's another 100, 150 in Stony Creek, which is right behind us. And to my knowledge, Neither we nor any one of those hundred homeowners were ever told that there was a Cape Fear Skyway on the books. I don't even know that what that is. That's well, what the map is that they just passed around. And the first version of that map in 2006 showed the Cape Fear Skyway coming right through my living room. Yeah, really? It did. It did. Because be the DOT when we invited them out to the neighborhood and they unrolled maps on our neighbor's dining room table, showed us maps that were dated in the 1970s when there was nothing but forest out there. Bridal Way has been there since the mid-1970s and it's not on their map. Needless to say, at that point, some of us, me in particular, became livid over the whole thing and the map that you now see shows two routes that go around behind Snee Farm and Stony Creek, not to mention going right past Brunswick Forest. And we will have the same problem that you're talking about. In fact, we're several hundred yards from 17, and I can hear the trucks all night. 
So a couple hundred yards isn't going to make a difference. Bottom line here is I am still involved, and I'm, it's been, what, 11 years now. I'm on the Citizens Advisory Committee. We look at the 20-year plan. Pat is on the TAC. She's the elected official and takes all the heat. We're just a bunch of old guys who try to plan 20, 40 years in advance. But that Cape Fear Skyway, now called, what is it, the Cape Fear Crossing, Crossing, still has a map that now instead of going through my dining room, it goes around behind my house. <laughs> they do? No. They you didn't tell me. Look, look, at the, look at the little curly, I'll show it to you after the, right. it's right there. I mean, it's probably 500 yeah, yards from my house. It's going to be avoidance. That's the avoidance <laughs> route, yes. She just whispered she was thinking it was into Brunswick Park. I was going to celebrate that. It was in Brunswick Park. It's not. I'll have a story I'll tell you about Brunswick Forest after the meeting, too. I don't want to be on record. But in any event, my point here is that whatever we can do as a town, we're, we are residents of the town of Leland, even though we're four miles down 17. But that's going to become an issue if they ever do build the Cape Fear Skyway on one of those two routes. There's, I mean, there's going to be people from Brunswick Forest, Snee Farm, and Stony Creek, and there's another uh, high-priced development um, off of Snowfield Road. What is it called? Snowfield. Oh, the one with the uh, the gates. The, yeah. the, yeah. the, the, the million-dollar houses there. Oh. It's going to go right in between Stony Creek yeah. Yeah. and that development. Yeah. So this will become an issue over the next 20 years if they ever find the money to build it, which we're hoping they don't do. <laughs> well, it's too late now, but uh, yes, it's going to become an issue for the town of Leland, and I don't know what the answer is. And just one random question, just for us, because we're not part of Leland. If we were to try to find somebody at the county level, yeah. I'll tell you what, let me, let, me, let me pull us back into our the orderly flow of our meeting here. Um, I think it's going to be a matter of <laughs> banding together and getting your neighborhoods, getting your, your, your folks together and say, look, we've got to organize, we've got to deal with the developer. Try, try dealing with uh, uh, Karen Collette at the uh, NCDOT and see what assistance she can possibly give if you go with the uh, tree planting idea. Um, at this point, that's all I could, can recommend. Uh, well, maybe the town council can send a, a letter of resolution, a resolution, if yeah. uh, something, or asking for help with these with a part. For our Isn't there any government agency, environmental agency, talking about the U.S. government, that could get involved in something like See, this? That's what I don't understand. You know, let's work together here. Yeah. You know, you got the forestry, the state forestry, you've got the state environment, feds has got all that. I mean, got Come on, guys, let's get together. I mean, there's somebody in some places would have some kind of funds or uh, grants or something you could think we could tap into. And environmental, I mean, every they, they say snail darters will face. This is an important thing, this people's issues. I know. Uh, I, I definitely think getting in touch with uh, uh, our congressman in Washington, D.C., because it, it's going to have to be changed on the federal level, Federal Highway Administration. And if I'm not mistaken, Rouser is a member of the Transportation Committee. I think so. All right, well, let's close this uh, discussion then, uh, for now and back to the agenda here. Um, is there any other discussion uh, that anyone wants to bring up for the, for the good body? Okay, then I'm going to call for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.